Hey people, um, so an online friend of mine, uh, Melissa Chen, who is a journalist uh, from Singapore originally, she's now based in the United States, um, she posted something which uh, is uh, is quite thought-provoking, um, not surprising, but thought-provoking, um, so I'm going to read this out, and all, all credit to Melissa, she, she brought attention to this, but... Um, She's basically showing a screenshot from, um, I don't know if it's Twitter or what, but um, yeah, uh, she's just written, when you troll the director of the Foreign Ministry Information Department of China for tweeting hot garbage, and I agree with Melissa because this is up. <laughs> oh, uh, Hua Chunying. Uh, she's probably the highest ranking woman in the Chinese Communist Party, or at least the most prominent. Uh, but basically, she wrote, the right to define democracy should not be monopolized by the US and its allies. A key criterion is whether the country can meet people's expectations. So uh, she's got this like uh, sort of comparison chart. This is Hua Chunying. Democracy, China, democracy of the people versus USA, democracy of money. China, democracy in essence. That means versus democracy in form. China, whole process democracy versus voting democracy once every four years. Uh, well, basically all three of those points need explained. Um, so I'm just going to break them down. Well, actually, I'll start with her criticisms as well, because, um, you know, that's the sort of target that uh, she's going for. This is why Chun Ying, just to clarify, uh, Melissa Chen is posting that she's not endorsing it. Quite the opposite. Um, so democracy and money in the USA. Well, uh, the United States is the world center of capitalism. Um, I would argue that there is too much money orientated in the United States. Uh, even many Americans would agree with that. There is probably too much of a role in big money in politics and in other areas. I do think too money defines too much in American life. Um, for example, being British, I'm grateful that if I get seriously injured, I don't have to worry about health insurance, right? So one could argue that is a flaw with American democracy. But again, we're putting this in, a, this is all down to moral equivalencies that the Chinese Communist Party seem to think they can lecture. So we'll get back to that. Democracy in form, well, she seems to acknowledge that point. It is democracy in form. It's, you know, people vote. Um, voting democracy once every four years. Well, that's been a consistent um, situation. And apart from the violence in Washington in January, American democracy, democracy has been overwhelmingly peaceful. The vast majority of presidential elections, save the odd bit of unrest, the vast majority has seen peaceful transfers of power. In fact, um, there was some tensions in the 1828 election, I believe, between Andrew Jackson and um, Martin Van Buren. But really, uh, compared to much of the world, American democracy is pretty peaceful, with the exception of this year. True, it's often partisan and angry, but that's true of most political situations where you have uh, different points of view. Um, so those three points uh, are, are true, but she's not disputing that there's democracy in form. And she's not disputing that there is an election once every four years. How to get to the, and, and the point about money, yeah, that's a problem. You know, probably there is too much money in American politics. And you get billion dollar elections, but even, even many Americans feel that way. So she's not really scoring points by saying that. Uh, you know, it's not like one over, especially when you consider that there are sons and daughters of senior Communist Party officials who live like uh, little emperors. So, you know, Chi I mean, Chinese capitalism, this is a great irony. Modern China is not actually that true to socialist principles, ironically. So for all their speeches and their preaching about being morally superior to the West, it's actually a pretty materialistic society. I've been there. I've seen it. This is not to say every Chinese person is like that. But, um, you know, there is definitely a materialistic side in Chinese culture. And given that the Communist Party has had an iron grip on power for the past 70 years, they must be at least partly culpable for that. You know, the two go hand in hand. Um, 
they might say that's American and Western influence. The young Chinese want to get the best smartphone. And the Chinese government, you know, uh, I I would take it with a pinch of skepticism that they, um, they've they always been true to socialist principles. In that sense, there's definitely a capitalist, uh, materialistic side to China going right up to the top. Um, so democracy of the people. <laughs> Well, this comes down to this idea that the communists won the civil war. It was a bloody civil war, one of the costliest in history. And, um, you know, Mao famously addressed the people at Tiananmen Square in 1949 when he declared the People's Republic of China. But like most states that have peoples in the title, it's anything but democratic. The same can be said for, um, I think it was formerly the People's Republic of Confuci, Confuci during the Khmer Rouge. In Cambodia, which was, you know, one of the most brutal regimes of the 20th century. Um, and Zaire, I think, had peoples in, in its name. Again, it wasn't a democracy. It was run by the strongman dictator um, Mobutu Sese Siko. Just a quick word, by the way, on dictators. This isn't really related to the video. Just in passing, because they'll probably not make a video on this. It's in Habre has died. The former Chadian dictator, he was uh, in power from 1982 to 1990, was then replaced by Idris Debe. He's just died in prison. Uh, this was a man responsible for about 40,000 deaths, some brutal human rights abuses. It's interesting and kind of coincidental that Chad's two dictators of modern times, Idris Debe and now Hissin Habre, have both died in the same year. Nothing to do with China, but I'm just saying that, passing it's kind of a coincidence. Anyway, um, so this thing about the democracy of the people, it's its kind of indoctrinated into the Chinese education system that we are a democracy because this is what the people want. But how can you have a true test of what the people want when they're never really given a choice? So sure, many Chinese will say that they support the CCP or they don't see a better alternative or something like this, but it isn't a real choice. That's the point. You can't say that it's a democracy when there isn't a choice. Even if, let's say, a majority of Chinese favour continued CCP rule. And I would say a lot of people would go for it on the grounds that they want stability. And they'll be scared that if China has a sudden transition or revolution, it would be violent. And that's understandable. People like stability. Um, in other words, you know, I'm not naive. I know a lot of Chinese don't lose sleep over for example, the human rights uh, abuses of the Uyghurs. They don't. That's a sad reality. They don't. They think about their own uh, situation. They think about living costs, that sort of thing. Um, so many Chinese kind of put up with the Communist Party because they don't know anything else. And it's a, it's a question of stability. That's understandable. But it is not democracy. It's just not. Um, democracy in essence, well, she would need to clarify what she means by that. And whole process democracy, again, what does that mean? Um, in China, you do get voting, believe it or not, but it's at a very, very low level. It's in like village elections um, where a village council will be determined. Uh, I remember having a debate with a woman who I thought was a mo like a moderate, but it turned out she was quite a hardline communist. You know, it took me by surprise. She was an acquaintance. And we were in Shanghai together for a mutual event. We had a mutual friend's wedding. Um, so you can imagine this was, uh, I, I met this woman because like, we were both going to the wedding. So we agreed to meet up and I knew her from the UK. She'd studied here and we had lunch. And it was civil. I mean, we weren't yelling at each other, but we had quite a tense debate. And because some of the things she was saying was just so patently untrue. And, you know, I was acutely aware I'm in her country. Um, in a sense, I'm in her hands because she knows Shanghai. I don't at that time. So, you know, I was kind of had to grip my teeth at a few points. But um, one of the points she made, uh, just as an example of this, is that China isn't a single party state. She tried arguing that there are other parties. So I decided to look this up. Well, there are other, technically other political parties in China other than the CCP. 
Chinese Communist Party. But the reality is these are puppet parties. They're not truly independent. They're all branches of the main Communist Party. And they're all under that umbrella of the Chinese Communist Party, really. So they might have slightly different names. I don't remember any off the top of my head. But they are insignificant. Uh, that's probably why I don't remember, because they're not significant enough to really be seen as credible opposition. Um, so it's not a multi-party democracy. It's just not. It's a single party state. And any Chinese national who says that's not true, they're lying or they're. It's just not true. It's a single party state. Whole process democracy again. What does that mean? Um, but you know, this taps into a deeper problem, which is that the only thing the CCP cares about, the only thing, the only thing, is their own power. That is it. That is absolutely it. I've never been convinced that they genuinely care about the Chinese people. Maybe at low level they do. So, you know, your average um, member of the Communist Party, because they tend to be normal people. They tend to be in normal professions. They just happen to be a member of the party. But when you start getting into higher rankings, like, um, you know, standing committee members, governors and so on, they are fully, in, you know, in, involved. They're fully in that uh, agenda of keeping CCP power. So it's the only thing they care about. Um, there has been examples of defectors who were quite deeply embedded in that system. And, you know, their their testimony is pretty much aligned to what this is. I came across a video last night. This is just keeping with the subject of China. It was um, from Strat4 or Strat... Uh, I forget the title of the channel right now off the top of my head. Anyways, an Indian source. So you might think, okay, well, that's India, they're biased. Yeah, India and China don't get on for obvious reasons. But the video, frankly, was hard to argue against because what I was doing was drawing analogies between Xi Jinping and Hitler. Now, this is something that can be overdone. Um, Hitler was a uniquely terrible figure in history. Um, but the way this video worked, and I really, really hope they don't kick it down, apparently the Chinese embassy has complained. I really, really hope they do not take that down. It would be a shame if they allowed themselves to be bullied and took it down from Chinese demand. And I hope the Indian government doesn't kind of pressure them to do it. Because what was argued in the video, I don't know how that could be seen as misleading or false. So uh, what the narrator done was showed what happened in the Third Reich in the 1930s showed how that built up and developed and developed through lies, through intimidation, through industrial scale propaganda, um, through annexation of land, etc. This is what's happening with China right now. Um, an example of this is Arunachal Pradesh in northern India. To most of the world, that is India. But the Chinese claim it's China on the grounds that there's... Um, ethnic links to the people there with China. Well, this is what Hitler done in the Sudetenland, and this is what Putin done in Ukraine. Justified annexation um, by saying that there is ethnic links to the territory in question. I believe China under Xi Jinping is dangerous to the world. I believe it, it should be isolated. I believe it's a rogue state um, under the Communist Party. I'm not saying that China itself is um, is a problem. But so long as it is under the control of the CCP, unfortunately, it is difficult to differentiate. You know, I can say the CCP is the CCP, China is China. But the problem is the CCP has an iron grip on power. So unfortunately, when we talk about China, that it is hard to differentiate in that sense. I differentiate the people and the culture. And I've always been very clear that I'm not against the Chinese people. But I am beyond fed up with the arrogance and the lies of the CCP. Um, of course, as a Westerner, because they're constantly sniping at my country. But more importantly, as a human being um, and a citizen of the world, because I genuinely believe 
This regime threatens threatens the world, really. We've seen that with COVID. Their shackling of the World Health Organization meant that this crisis, this pandemic, wasn't contained in those very critical early weeks when it should have been. Because after the SARS crisis, when China was strongly rebuked by the World Health Organization, they started a very, very concerted campaign to have influence there, and it's been effective. Um, so this uh, this absurd analogy by Hua Chunying um, trying to claim that China is a democracy, you know, uh, she needs to explain why China still... Actually, the point about Tiananmen Square, it's often brought up as an example of Chinese state brutality, but governments don't often bring it up. Maybe it's about time they did. Maybe it's about time they did, because usually what happens in these east-west spats between Beijing and Western countries, and indeed between Beijing and Asian countries, it's not just an east-west thing. Um, you know, often we talk about uh, the current situation, and that's valid. That's what the focus should be. But if the Chinese regime is going to come out with blatant lies like this, and they're going to, you know, dare to lecture the West, I think, why not? Let's throw history at them. Let's ask them to explain why they still hide Tiananmen Square. They need to be humiliated. They need to be put on the spot. I'm talking about the Chinese regime. I'm not talking about the Chinese people or the nation. But I really, really do think that the CCP needs to be shamed. I think they need to be put on the spot. Let them make their thuggish threats. Let them make their lies. Because any free-thinking person, I don't care what country you're from, you don't have to be a Westerner to feel this way. You know, there's many, many Indians feel this way. Filipinos, Japanese, South Koreans, Taiwanese. There are a lot of people in this world that are utterly sick of China's behavior. China under the CCP, that is. And there's a lot of Chinese citizens who are fed up with this. The problem is, it's difficult for them to speak out because, you know, the cult of nationalism is so intensely drilled in that any Chinese person who condemned the CCP would be seen as, um, you know, they'd be called a traitor. So I appreciate it is difficult for them to speak out. But I'm, I'm optimistic that there is actually quite a lot of people out there who are Chinese and they, they don't hate their country. But they uh, they know that the CCP is a problem for it. But I I really do feel we are in something equivalent to the thirties now on Xi Jinping Xi Jinping and Hitler, and I'll make a link to that video. There are differences. Um, she and Hitler have different personalities. She is a lot more calm and collected. He doesn't tend to rant. So in that sense, he's a normal politician in the sense that he doesn't, you know, he comes across as kind of normal, apart from his fuggish threats. He tends to be quite calm when he makes speeches, from what I've seen. He never rants and raves. Um, as far as I know, he doesn't have any major eccentricities like a lot of dictators do. He's quite normal. But then again, uh, when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party, the private lives of leaders is very heavily censored. It's not like in you know, democracies where there's gossip about the leaders. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, by the way. I'm just saying that there is, um, there's a certain transparency that you don't get in totalitarian states. But in the case of China, um, I mean, no one knows what his hobbies are or things like that. And that might sound trivial, but it taps into a wider issue of transparency. Who is this man? Um, he is the president of China. He's one of the most powerful men in the world. Uh, but, you know, there's also always a distance there with Chinese leaders. And yet, yet he is one of the most powerful men in the world. So, you know, easily in the top three. So, with all this being said, I simply reiterate what I've always said. We need to take China very seriously as a threat. This country cannot be trusted under the CCP. They're not our friends, they're not our allies. And every arrogant jingoistic statement they make, I believe, has to be met. I think we need to fight fire with fire when it comes to rhetoric. I don't agree that we should just kind of, you know, the approach to Germany and Italy is taking, you know, let's just pull it down, let's just hope that they reform. That's just profoundly naive. 
it won't work. It's been tried and it will not work. China sees that as weakness. And it's not that they will necessarily respect countries standing up to them. They'll just get more aggressive and jingoistic. But they're going to do that regardless, either way. You know, if we take the softly, softly approach, they walk over us. And if we stand up to them, which is the right thing to do, then they, you know, they rant and they rave. That's the situation. But that is the nature of the Communist Party. Frankly, I despise them. I don't despise China or the Chinese people, but I, I loathe the Chinese Communist Party with a passion. I loathe their lies. I love their arrogance, I love their jingoism, I love their inhumanity. I mean, it's, it's a very dangerous thing, actually, when you have people who are so uh, dogmatic in power that they, they really don't care about truth, you know. Truth isn't important to the Chinese Communist Party. Power is the only thing that matters to them. That's their values. And they might say they've lifted millions out of poverty. Yeah, that's true. The Chinese economy is growing a lot. And some people might say that's enough to vindicate them. I don't think it is. I don't think that justifies all the lies and the jingoism and the brutality. I don't think that justifies betraying the mothers of Tiananmen Square who have never got justice their murdered children. The only thing is that um, history will record you know, the truth is pure. The truth cannot change, no matter how much propaganda. The truth is the truth.